Um, let me just uh, tell you that um, from Thanksgiving through the first week in January, we will be starting next first week. We will not be having Wednesday night service. Uh, usually, December is a very low month. People are very busy and so forth. And so, we, we will uh, be having next week, and then we will have uh, Thanksgiving Eve services on the on the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, and then. There will be those uh, five, uh, four or five weeks. I can't remember which year. We'll be having Thanksgiving dinner that night, yes. And uh, uh, several people have a big dinner planned. And, and so we invite you to be here for that. And then we will be off uh, those five weeks of doing this. And we will pick up in, on the first Wednesday in January. And the, uh, I've asked the the uh, Prescott crew put a big dinner together that night, and so we'll have a big startup dinner that first beginning back in uh, uh, January. Okay, and so uh, if you love the Lord, just say Amen. 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 Uh, let me apologize up front. I tried to get all of this into one lesson, I did. So this is, a, this is another part, two parts. Uh, and so, but you get uh, most of it tonight, and then we'll have a what? lesson next week. How about that? All right. <laughs> Teacher, well, you expect that we ain't going to study when we study. Um, <laughs> any praise reports? Anybody got a praise report? Yes. My uncle's uh, non oxygen lymphoma is contained to just this one day, so it hadn't spread anywhere else. So What's your uncle's name? Bob Horton. Bob, Bob, Bob. My last day from the last brother. Anyone else? Something significant 
in this world with your life. But before you can ever become what you, everything that God created you to be, you need to learn to grow spiritually in your life. Uh, so many of us uh, neglect this particular area of our life just as a baby is born and that day that you become an adult has to do things, eat the thing, right things, grow and, and, and mature that and also emotionally and mentally. The same thing goes with the spirit world as well. It's a parallel thing that your life in the spirit parallels your life in the flesh. They may not line up with each other, but it's the same uh, progression. And so you have to grow spiritually. You start with a spiritual birth, uh, the moment you accept that invitation to be in a relationship with the divine, and then the most amazing thing is that that invitation brings a consciousness of, of for your forgiveness of wrongdoings, and, and what that simply means is wipes the slate clean with you and God. Uh, it's already, you know, don't blow your mind, but it's already clean with God. <laughs> you know, it, 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 because God is a forgiving God. But, but you don't receive that until you accept it, until you uh, confess it and accept it. That's the whole point. It's wiped out. And, and it's what many people call the new birth. But all it means is starting over with a clean slate. But after that spiritual birth, new birth, comes spiritual growth. If you ever go to become spiritual to it. And so as we close this series on clear thinking, I thought this would be a good time to talk about clear thinking about spiritual growth. And um, Jesus told a story in the Bible uh, that illustrates three. This is not the one. I'm just going to cheat sheet here. One thing I have to actually have to answer that. Um, that, that talk, illustrate three of the barriers that we have to spiritually grow. Uh, and he says, and in this parable, in this story, he tells us that there are three keys to growing to your full potential that God has for you. And, and in the story, Jesus is talking, he's using a farm, and he says, a farmer goes out to grow, to uh, plant some seeds, sow some seeds. In the old days, they used, they didn't literally did it, uh, with their hand. It wasn't so over the days. I don't know what we did with the hand too. Uh, but in those days, the farmer would just throw out the seed and it would fall on four different kinds of soil. And, 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 and so uh, these, these represent different responses that we have to God in the story. And later on, Jesus comes back and interprets this story line by line, and it tells you what each one is. And he says that the farmer represents God, and the seed represents God's word to us. And he says that the soil is our attitude. The soil is our heart. The soil that the word is talking about is our responsiveness to what God wants to do in our life. And he says from this story, you can learn three really important keys to growing spiritually. Now, I'm going to give you two tonight, and we'll take that third. We'll take the top of the third one next week, okay? And so Jesus says, if you want to grow spiritually, I must be receptive, receptive to God. Come on, boy. You do you your head for something that's not kind of like something, don't you? <laughs> I think your mic's going to go out. <laughs> they can still hear me in this room. <laughs> and he can edit for that purpose. What does that mean? I must be receptive to God. It means I've got to want to grow. I've got to be eager to grow. I've got to be ready to grow. I need to be spiritually receptive. The primary, most, the primary reason that most people don't grow is obvious. They don't want to grow. They don't want to grow. I mean, they are spiritually unreceptive. They're spiritually unresponsive. Let me tell you something. There are people that sit in the church 50 years and they got no further than one step from where they came in. 
Amen? This ain't about how long you've been in church. Some of the most unreceptive people to God I've ever met is in church. But it's the truth. And there are all kinds of, you know, um, when you come to church, let me tell you something. Just by being here tonight, just by being here tonight, showed a degree of of receptiveness to learning a spiritual truth. Uh, there are all kind of folks in, in our community, and, and even this community around this church here, that don't show any kind of responsiveness to God. Jesus said, that's what the first soil is like. Luke 8 and 5 said, the farmer went out to plant some seed, and he scattered it across this field, and some seed fell on a footpath where it had been stepped on, and the birds came, and they ate it. And then if you drop down to verse 12, he says, he gives meaning to this, and he says, the hard path where some seed fell represents the hard hearts of those who hear the word of God, but the devil comes over, comes and steals the word away and prevents people from believing and being saved. On every farm, anybody ever grew up on a farm? Is there someone out there do? On who? Okay. Um, yeah, leave the door open. Now, what was that? Oh. oh no. Anybody, 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 have you ever walked through the field? There's footpaths. Right? There are footpaths. At least there are miles of wood. And, 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 uh, and, and you, that's where the farmer, the gardener, whatever you call it, walks through the crop. And, and, and because Oh, you walk them over and over and over and over again. Uh, what happens? It's hard. It gets compacted. That's how the get gets compacted. And there are two things about a footpath. Number one is very hard. And number two is narrow. Okay? You don't want to take up too much room. So it's very hard and it's narrow. And, and when the seed is thrown out there, when the scattering seed, um, this kind of hard packed soil doesn't give it a chance to penetrate. That seed don't get on the ground. And so the birds come along and they eat it before it can even take root. Why? Because it's laying there on the surface. They don't get a chance to spot anything. And Jesus says, sometimes y'all are just like that. <laughs> no, let me rephrase. Sometimes we are just like that. Uh, and, 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 uh, and Jesus said that uh, our minds are like that. We have this hardening of the attitude. Uh, you know, some of you, some of us have this thing, don't confuse me with that. <laughs> don't confuse me with the truth. I've already made my mind up. And so a hardened soil represents what? A closed mind. A closed mind. My life won't be quite as good. It represents a closed mind. Um, it's a closed mind. It's a narrow mind. And too often, we never give God an opportunity to work in our lives. We don't give God a chance to answer our prayer because we don't pray. Right. Scripture says you have not because you ask not. We don't give a God a chance to do miracles in our lives because we don't believe in miracles. My mother said that, uh, you know why you don't see as many miracles here as you do? In other places that we go evangelize, that we 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 uh, we said God can do anything, but then we sit there and rationalize why God ain't gonna do it. And we go into these third world countries, we preach, we preach God can do anything, and they believe it. And so their faith says God can do anything, and you so they begin to see miracles because they ain't trying to rationalize what they're receptive to the presence of God. And when you're receptive, if you want to see miracles, you've got to be receptive to miracles. We don't give a chance, God a chance to grow a spiritual because we're not sure. We're not sure that God wants to grow us. And so many times we're just closed-minded. And when our minds are closed, when our hearts are hard, and when we are unwilling to listen, nothing is going to grow there. Amen? Because that closed mind is compacted so Amen? Right. And so, so what causes uh, people
people to be close to God? What, what causes us to be defensive uh, when people start even talking to us about God? It's usually one of three reasons. And the first one is what? Fear. fear. Oh, you got it. First one is fear. Um, we close our minds to God because of fear. Obviously, listen, if you are afraid of God, this is why I try to work my dead level best to get people not to be afraid of God. I try to break down every barrier I can that people have about being afraid of God. Because if you are afraid of God, you're not going to get close to God. You want God to be out there somewhere. And, and, and you're not going to want to grow spiritually because you don't want to be close enough to him. And we think, if I get close to God, I ask me to do something I don't want to do. Well, that's true, we might. But it ain't going to be something that hurts you. It'll be something that's got your best interest at heart. You see, we don't always know what's our best interest. Because if I thought, if I use this little brain to try to figure out my best interest, how did that, well, I have, and gotten lots of trouble for it there. Because we think, oh, well, I think, well, if I get too close to God, I'm going to become a religious man. Like, you know, those folks in J.R. real good, speaking in tongues, running the aisles, holding out jumping pews. You should be so lucky. <laughs> oh, oh, better yet, a lot of us are afraid that we will lose our freedom if we get too close to God. That somehow God is going to, uh, that we're going to, if we get all spiritual, and all of a sudden, I can't have any fun anymore. One of the nice things, I didn't know it at the time, I've shared this before, but one of the sweetest things that was said to me, a little kid named Jackson used to come here. Um, I went to his school. I was speaking at school. And then that Sunday, he and his mom, what was his mom's name? My man? I thought, my name, my man, I think it was a man. Uh, I was leaving, and he said, you know what I like about you, Pastor <laughs> J.R.? I said, what can you do? You're not that holy. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't say, well, thank you, you But I just looked at him, and he, he got the idea. He said, no, no, what I'm saying is, you're not hooked. You're not one way in church and another way when you came over to the school. You're the same everywhere. And, and, and I figured at that point he was giving me a compliment. Okay? But, but the thing about it is, if, if, if I'm afraid, and God's going to take all the fun out of life. I'm going to lose my freedom. I'm not going to have fun. Am I going to want to get close to God? And so, those are legitimate fears. If you're afraid of God, you're going to, you close your mind to God. And, and you harden your heart. You shut it down because you don't really want to know God. The second, thank you, thank you for my, my writing. The second reason people close down to God is, Bitterness, bitterness. I guess that is a barrier, though, isn't it? That's a huge barrier when you stop to think about it. Uh, you know what I mean by that? It means resentment. And usually it's resentment over something that has hurt you in the past. And this is how it usually plays out in our lives. Uh, they think about a hurt that they've had, and, they, and then they start rationalizing. If God allowed that, no thanks to God. Amen? They're thinking, God, why did you allow that to happen to me? Uh, some, some of us have lost a loved one. And we think, why? Why did this happen to me? Or maybe you've been abused emotionally and mentally, uh, physically or sexually, and it hurt, and it still hurts you today. Uh, and, and, and you can remember that trauma happening to you. And in your mind, you ask, why did God allow that to happen? Or maybe you've been betrayed or deserted by a partner, a spouse, and your heart was ripped out over that thing. And, 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 and you can feel still feel the pain of that rejection. And many of our community have been hurt by Christians in their self-righteous, judgmental, hypocritical standards that even themselves can keep. And you think if that's Christianity, if that's God, then no thanks God. And so that bitterness that you have from that hurt, 
that you hold against other people, you project it onto God, especially if they are around to be projected on them. And when you do that, when you have that barrier built up of bitterness and resentment, guess what? You're not going to grow spiritually. Because you think, why did God allow this to happen? And you're angry at God. Why did God allow this to happen? Why did God allow this to happen? Well, the reality is that we all have free will. And that's the one thing that God will not override. Because, and there's a reason you have free will. Because you were created for fellowship with God. You were created for fellowship with God. If you don't have a free will to say no, if it's compulsory, and you're required to have a relationship with God, that's not fellowship. Amen? And so God could take your free will. And, well, let me just say this first. Um, God gives us free will. And often we and other people use our free will to choose to do things that are wrong. And sometimes those wrong things have consequences that hurt other people. Sometimes they hurt you. But we use that free will to hurt other people. And God could take away that free will and, and you'd never hurt nobody else again and nobody would ever hurt you. But then you would not be having fellowship with God. Because you were created to have fellowship with God and you can't have fellowship with God if it's not a choice that you make. Amen? And I'll say this, if you've been hurt, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you hurt me. And God hurts for you. But what I want to tell you is don't turn away from God. Let your pain turn you to God so that you can receive God's comfort. Never let another person or another experience become between you and God. Because all that does is keep you away from God. And it keeps you from growing spiritually. And so what you need to do is you need to learn to deal with the issue, whatever it is. It ain't, ple it ain't pleasant. You know, it ain't always pleasant, but you need to get it out of the way. Because when you hold on to a hurt, uh, when, when your heart becomes uh, cold and hard, uh, uh, nothing can grow there. Not even God's love. Not even your spiritual growth. Because we set up walls and we become defensive. The third reason uh, we... Um, are close to God's, we close down to God as what? Pride. Yeah, I don't think y'all get that. Just plain old pride. Pride keeps us from being receptive to God. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we just, we, we, we're too polite to say that pride. Because God may hear us. Not knowing that God hear us on the heart. But sometimes we think, well, um, I, we don't think we need God. I mean, you know how some of us self-sufficient people are. I mean, we think, I can handle it. I can figure it out. I got myself into this. I can get myself out. Now we find ourselves digging into a deeper and deeper hole. Listen, if I don't think I need God, guess what? Well, if I'm afraid of God, if I'm angry with God, Here's the problem. An unreceptive, a hard, a, 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 a hard heart, a closed mind means that nothing can grow to you. Amen. This is blocking this. And, and Jesus said, you see this thrown out down the ground? But it don't do any sprouting because as soon as because it's hard. And the birds just come up. And the birds of it. Birds of resentment, the birds of pride, just come along and eat all that good seed up that we should take You want to grow? You got to first of all be what? The second thing is I must be 
Yeah. Must return to go? No, I thought I didn't know this one. Resolved to grow. Resolved to grow. What do I mean by that? I gotta be deliberate. I gotta make a decision. I gotta make a choice. I got to make a commitment. I have a responsibility for my own spiritual growth. I have a responsibility. But, uh, you know, um, if you don't get anything else, get this. Spiritual growth and spiritual maturity is a choice that you make. You are as close to God as you want to be. Don't blame anybody else if you don't feel close to God. It's not even God's fault. Uh, if you feel far from God, guess who moved? Guess who moved? I, I, think, I love to think about the old I love the, the old cartoon that was in the family circle. Uh, is she okay? She's got a nose. She's not pretty. Where are you? No. God, we lift up our sister Judy, having a nose bleed. Whatever that condition is, God, we ask you to guide her and take care of her. We know that you're with her and you're her divine physician. So we just ask you to be with her and help her to know whatever she needs to do, God. We also lift up the gentleman who came here a few minutes ago, said he was handing the press that he needed to. We lift up him and his family, and we just thank you to people who donated to you that we could give you. And we lift these up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I believe in prayer, okay? Um, the old family is so, the family, what is it? is it called family circle? Yeah. Cartoon. Yeah. Where the mom and dad are driving down the road, the mom looks over the dad and drives and says, Honey, you remember when we first got together, how close we used to sit when we drove down the road? And he looked down and said, I have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> That's how God feels. When we said, I wish I was close, why am I not close to God? God said, I have a clue. I'm right here. All you have to do is be. Open to it and resolve to grow, and you, you know, I'm here. You see, uh, God didn't move. You can't blame your spouse, you can't blame your parents, you can't blame people who hurt you. You're as close to God as you want to be because if you're not as close to God as you want to be, uh, you think you should be, then I look and see what I'm, well, I, I'm putting out that block, no, block that knowing that I'm close to God. Amen. You want to grow, you got to be resolved. All that means, I use that word because we went along to the session in the next year. But, um, you know, sometimes when you're doing this, you do that kind of thing. I mean, all ours. But uh, you, make, you make a decision to grow. Without a commitment to grow, you're never going to grow spiritually. I'm just telling you up front. Instead, uh, without being resolved to grow, you're going to live a pretty shallow life. And Jesus talks about this. In the second kind of soul, he says that the second kind of soul, this shallow soul, represents what? Spiritual complacency. Uh, no. Superficial commitment. Superficial commitment. Uh, let's, let's look at what the scripture says. Verse 6, uh, it says, of the seed fell on shallow soil under, with underlying rock. The seed began to grow, but soon it withered and died because of a lack of moisture. What is he talking about here? Has that ever been to Israel? Israel is, uh, yeah, I've been to Israel. It's, 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 it's a great place to visit, isn't it? Uh, there's, you know, I, I don't like the new cities. I like the old ones. It's so historic. Uh, yeah, so you, you really did have those old cities, didn't you? They didn't have those old cities back then. Right? Uh, so, uh, but in Israel, most of that nation is a thin level of topsoil with this solid bedrock limestone underneath it. I mean, in a lot of places, 
require you to do something in order for it to benefit you. Because you see, what we have gotten into this habit of being entertained by the preacher. And so people don't fundamentally, I'm not that again. People don't, I'm not transformed. <laughs> When you're entertained by the preacher, you're transformed when you allow the Word of God. When you have resolved and prepared yourself to hear the Word of God and let the Word of God change you. Not change who you are, but change and transform who you are. Remember the word that said change who you are. The word in the second, second, second verse of Romans 12, the, be ye transformed by the renewing of your heart and your mind. And so, in order for to be transformed, you got to do something, okay? Some things we hear, we're excited about it, and we never do anything about it. And because of it, we don't grow. And all of us struggle right here. Preachers even struggle. Those preachers get ahead. Let me tell you what one of the bad habits of preachers. One of the bad habits of preachers is to only... Be caught up in scripture when they're starting a lesson or something. And they think, well, that's my scripture. No, it's not. You're working. <laughs> when I do that, I'm working. There's a reason I have a separate time that I ain't doing nothing with the scripture. That I, I read it. Uh, I read a meditation. Because I need to grow. I Needs a spiritual growth. You're never there. Let me tell you. What happens if you grow to be 21 and stop eating? What makes you think that changes in your spiritual life? If when preachers think, oh, I, I, I didn't took this class, and if I had this in college. I had this in Old Testament survey, New Testament survey. Had it in Greek and had it in hymenetics and homiletics. That's work. That's not growth spiritually. When I, when I took those classes, I took those classes to prepare for the ministry. I wasn't, and that wasn't spiritually growth. That's pretty growth wasn't there. We don't get anything out of those papers, do we? Honey, we just want to get an A on that paper. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? And so, in order for me to grow spiritually, even as a pastor, I've got to resolve to grow. I've got to do something, do something for me, be receptive for the word to reach me outside of it. This has been a bad week for me. Started out talking to Casey. Great nephew. He died of sexual uh, cancer. Cancer in the spot. And then I get a call from Wes. I talk to Dwayne. He's at NIH. They can't do anything else. They're cheap and they work. So they just send me a call. And they're my friend. So there's sometimes. The two will collide. The, the, the. So I still had to do my work this week. So I sat down and I was reading all the scriptures, the lectionary signs for this week. They're more than the normal, by the way. There's seven of them this week. It's usually only four. There's seven this week. But I read them all. I read all of them. But one caught my attention. So I stopped doing my work. I went back. I read it again. And then I just left everything. And I sit there with that word. And you're going to hear that word Sunday because it came out of my private time. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to be entertaining you Sunday. You're going to get the word Sunday. I'm going to be expository preaching Sunday. <laughs> Where the word does the preaching. And I'm just going to give some commentary. You might even get out here at some kind of. <laughs> well, sometimes I get carried away even that way. But it spoke to me. Why? Because I made room, I stopped the work and made room for it to work. I could be 
he heads up book, you read Isaiah 12, only six verses. Isaiah 12, only six verses. You see, sometimes we hear something exciting, we never do anything about it. You know, studies have showed that uh, we only remember about 5% of what we heard after 72 hours. Now, some of you are able to tend to be a little bit better, you get up to 6 or 7%. Amen. But Matthew 7:26 says, Jesus said, anyone who hears the words of mine and doesn't put them into practice, what do you have to do to put it into practice? You have to do something, right? It's like a foolish person who built their house on the sand. In other words, he's just saying it's not going to last if you don't do something about it. And the point here is you got to invest some time. You got to let you got you got to let it sink in. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons we give you these outlines and even have you. Do you know why I actually give you fill in the blank? Because it's proven that if you actually write something down, you remember it longer than if it's just read off the piece of paper. That's the reason I do this. Studies show that. Amen? So what am I going to do about it? Well, have you ever noticed how easy it is to commit to something and then not follow through? Have, have you ever noticed that? So easy to commit. So, and it bothers us when that happens. How, how do you um, make that desire to grow? How do you have a commitment to grow? You put down some roots. How do you put down roots? You do it by making a commitment and keeping that commitment. Now, here's the problem with making commitments and keeping commitments around spiritual growth. We say, I'm going to read my Bible every morning. And then I'm running late one morning. So I get up and I don't keep that commitment. And then we start beating ourselves up because we didn't keep that commitment. When you make a commitment to grow, make it flexible so that it doesn't become a chore. So that you don't beat yourself up. I have about five uh, meditations I, I use. I use Richard Rohr, I use uh, uh, Sustainer, I use uh, the UCC one, what is it called, Fruits or something. Uh, uh, I use uh, uh, one that, you know, I, I've had for a long time that I'm going through again, uh, Maxwell Collins, A Graceful Moment. And I also use uh, the Daily Office in the Episcopal Church. This law, that one that takes a while. But you know what? Someday I don't do anything. Kind of. My day is busy. Maybe I don't feel good. Do you think I feel bad about it? No. I just delete something and go to the next day. I don't even try to go back to catch up. You know why I do why do I do it that way? Because I make it my like, growth flexible enough so I'm not beat up by it. I make the commitment. See, I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I don't do it for two or three days. If something gets it, like if I'm traveling, I usually only do one. And I'll get one. That's the one. Uh, this last weekend, I did ritual. I didn't do any of the rest. That's not even, but it, it's the son of a, what? Contemplation again. Yeah, son of a contemplation. We just call it ritual because that's the man who does it. Uh, but, um, um, that's right. And so, that's the only one I did because I was, you know, I was suffering in that trip to Alumbo Key doing that way. Now I don't know what was going on. It was a chore, you know. Y'all feeling sorry for me, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can tell. So you make a commitment and you keep the commitment, but you make it flexible enough so you don't beat yourself up and then become a chore. You know, because if you do that, you defeat the whole purpose of trying to grow spiritually. James 1.22 said, don't only hear the message, but put it into practice. Otherwise, you're really de deluding yourself. Uh, you know, there's something dangerous about coming to church a lot of times, especially for those of us who have grown up in church. You can come and hear somebody talk about God, talk about the world spiritually, and go away thinking you've just done your exercise in growing spiritually. All you did was listen to somebody. So all you did was just listen to somebody. I like people to talk about them. Thank you. He used to try, but now he didn't give up. I've been there. 
been beat too much by you. It takes a commitment to grow, and then it takes doing it to make it happen. Uh, first Corinthians, first Timothy, one twelve. Let me get this mention. Take time, take the time and trouble to keep yourself spiritually fit. Notice the words there: time and trouble. If you go to the gym, it takes time. And then machine means you take trouble to get this. Is that not true? I mean, I tell you, I, you know, recently I felt like a, a good friend of mine when he said, "I have a, I have a, a treadmill at my house. I get on it every day. Turned it on yesterday. Whoop, I know the last one. Because it takes time and trouble." Same thing with your spirit. It takes time. Uh, it takes some energy. I'm not going to say it takes trouble. It takes time. I would use a different word there. It takes time and energy to, uh, uh, to stay, to grow spiritually. It means you have to make a commitment and you have to grow. Okay? Where do you start? You put down some roots. And you, take, you make some commitments, put down some roots. These are going to be very quick, so write thanks. Huh? Let, let me give you five commitments. Uh, to you, and I'm not, I'm not going to ask you what they mean. I'm just going to give it to you. Number one, I got to I got to connect with others. I got to connect with others. That means you need to be part of a church family, or some kind of spiritual family. You 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 need to spend around. The reason I said this, you need to spend some time around other people who want to grow spiritually. If you want to be around somebody else and just gossip, you ain't gonna grow spiritually. And I'm just going to tell you, uh, you know, and so i got to look at my life and i got to want to say, I want this to happen, you know, and i got to do something about it. Uh, uh, the, the spiritual growth in my life means, you know, you don't do it on your own. Well, you know, I do the meditation by myself, but we often will write those people who are doing We know the other folks in church who are doing what you want. And we will write when something particular uh Jamie will send me something that said, well, this one particular point is that Judy will send another one and say, this was, this, wow, she'll do this, wow, this thing. And sometimes Richard was, yeah, I mean, uh, Peter, not Richard. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and I really appreciate this. Sometimes I'll say, this will preach. Uh, you see what I'm saying? What are we doing? With that, we encourage you to do in our spiritual growth. That's all we're doing. Encourage. So you need to be around people. The number one factor to help you grow is the encouragement of other people. Okay? Number two, I, I, I commit to build spiritual habits. What do I mean by that? Gotta want to spend some time in God's Word. Gotta make make that kind of commitment that a habit. Uh, let me tell you that talking to God in prayer is not natural for a lot of folks. In order for you to get to conversational prayer, you gotta practice it. I suggest you forget everything you learned in church about praying if you want to grow spiritually, because it makes you want to sound holy. And God I think, why don't you just shut up and talk to me like you talk? As if God's gotta be pleased with the way you talk. But God don't I can tell you right now, God don't like the way I talk to God sometimes. I'm okay with that, and God's okay with that, too. I'm getting through. Okay? And so, number number three, I commit to use my talents. Let me tell you something. If you sit down with talent, whatever that gift, whatever that ability God's given to you, you need to be using it to help somebody. You need to get off your western shore. If the oldest member of our church can come in here on Wednesday night and sing, and come in here on Sunday morning and get a nice scene, you can do something. How old you brought? 87? If an 87 year old man can come in here on make his business, can I go with that? I embarrass you. I didn't have to embarrass you. If I, if I do, I'm going to get it off before. I'm going to get it off before. I'm going to get it off before. <laughs> but, but I, you see what I'm saying? If he can use his gift, you can use yours. David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than where with to uh, dwell in the temple of the If David, King David, can say, I'd rather be an usher in the church.
church, then you can do it too. Just saying. You want to grow? You got to use the gifts God has used. If you're given not talking, being up in front of people, then find something behind the scenes. You can, you can go sign those cards. And then, number four, I commit to share my faith. Not to beat people up with the word. Let me tell you what witnessing is really about. Witnessing is not preaching. You give me an outreach to it. That's my gift. Okay? That, that's what I'm called to do. Don't you try to preach it to me. you sharing your faith, man. All you do is you tell somebody else your story. Well, she got to take the offer, offer tonight. Well, maybe not tonight. Then you've heard her talk about what this church meant to her. That's all she's doing, sharing her faith. Witness is just sharing your faith. You don't have to preach. Uh, you know, I tell people, show your faith. People, what well, if they ask me a question I don't know? Then tell them I don't know. Well, hold it up. I don't know. You might want to say, and, you know, I'll try to find out. Get back with you. I'll ask the pastor. If he don't know you, tell you if he don't know you. We'll look it up together. When, when, um, uh, Tammy and Jennifer, they created this board game. You remember that board game that had all, Lord, my phone. They would call me all kinds of times of the day asking me questions. <laughs> now, what does this mean? And there were times I said, I ain't, I ain't in your Bible, I don't know. I'm not going to play the Bible, I'm going to say, I don't know. And that's what you should do, too. Show your faith. You don't have to have all the answers. All you're doing is sharing what, what God's done for you. What God means to you. If you talk about church, tell them why you come here. That's all I mean. Uh, number five. I commit to fulfill my purpose. The reason that God put you on this earth is to bring glory to God. And the reason God put me on earth, you and me on earth, is to make a difference in this world. And I tell you how you always know God's will. You've heard it before. All four things are going to be present in order to, for it to be God's will. Number one, it has to enrich your life. God's not going to make you do something that doesn't enrich your life. So he's got to enrich your life. Number two, he's got to bless somebody else. If he doesn't do those two things, it ain't God's will. Number three, uh, is not to glorify God. God's not going to ask you to do anything that doesn't enrich your life, help somebody else, and glorify God. And then the fourth thing is not line up the word of God. Got to be all four of those things present, or it ain't God's will. It's just that simple. So it's got to enrich your life, it's got to bless somebody else, it's got to glorify God, and it's got to uh, line up with God's word. If it didn't do that, it's a pretty good sign that this is not God's will. Okay? And so, make commitment to grow. Start, send down, send down those roots to grow. If you're going to grow, you got to first be receptive to God's word. Oh, you move, you move. Okay. And then, second, you got to resolve to grow. So you make a commitment to grow. Let me just ask you in closing, what's the next step? Go ahead. What's your next step? It simply means you got to do something about it. If you really want to grow, you got to do something concrete. It doesn't come from osmosis. It doesn't come with just sitting and listening to the preacher. You don't just listen to it and delude yourself into thinking, hearing that, that, that teaching was spiritual growth for me. No, you got to do something about this in order for it to grow. You're not growing until you put it into action. And it starts right here in your mouth or in your brain. By asking God something. Maybe it's just a little course. In my life, Lord, be glorified. Be glorified through my spiritual growth, my spiritual, the way I'm spiritually mature. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. 